This is chapter 19 of our book. I got to be careful. I listen to these things and realize how loud I talk. I just can't help it. I'm just so passionate about U.S. history. Um, but with this mic, it gets kind of loud. So let me know if it's too much. I'll try to get an external mic or something. Um, the book has a lot. This chapter is a lot. This chapter 19. Um, and I'm not going to focus on everything. The politics I find quite boring. Um, and you don't really need to know that much, I don't think. Uh, Teddy Roosevelt, you know, did some stuff. You know, I don't know what else. Um, I don't know if Grover Cleveland is going to be a big uh, source of, of, of interrogation on the college board exam. Um, so what I'm going to focus on is something that will help you remember the politics, but that uh, isn't the politics, at least not in the traditional sense, and that is the social movements of the time period. Um, and how they shape and are shaped by the um, more institutionalized political movements of the time period. We got, um, how many slides here? Not 16. I'm not going to, there's a bunch of stuff I'm not going to do. 11 slides. I'm going to do this in one go. Hopefully it'll be, it'll probably be around 42 minutes uh, altogether. We'll see. Um, uh, but I'm not going to stop. So if it's going to, it's a long one. It's a long one. Okay. So anyway, I'm going to give you an overview of the big picture timeline, how politics changes from the 1870s into the 1890s, into the uh, eight, uh, uh, turn of the century, and then into the new century. Um, and going to outline some of the various um, uh, political movements that are, are formed kind of organically, democratically, that being the populace, the progressives, um, and all that kind of stuff. I'll do a little uh, overview of how we can try to understand the progressive movement of the uh, early part of the century. Um, and then that'll be about it. Uh, talk about some amendments and some laws that get passed. But the key thing here, right, is that like, it's not about memorizing every law that's passed. It's if you know that this is a time period of social movements, radical change, demand for more government regulation. Sorry, I'm turning on my heater here. My feet are cold. Um, then you know, like if, you know, there's some question about some kind of whatever progressive piece of legislation that's passed in the 1880s did it is it true or is it not true you know probably knows true because like that's the theme of the time period right um okay anyway i'm kind of blathering let's do it okay background um we talked about Reconstruction. Reconstruction ends in 1877 with the Compromise of 1877. Um, that is when Samuel Tilden concedes the election and Grover, uh, sorry, um, Rutherford B. Hayes uh, is elected, even though he doesn't win the popular vote. Um, of course, we know that the South is like legit vote fraud happening here, not some fantasy land kind of stuff like we have now, but rather legit you know, voter intimidation, the black voters, right, who are going to vote Republican. So widespread fraud, but they've got the numbers, right? They win the popular vote. 1877, the compromise ends Reconstruction, and we enter a new, a tra new tragic period of American history for uh, race relations. But we also enter a new national, um, uh, the, the nation changes its focus uh, in terms of what it wants to be dedicated to. Uh, 1870s, radical, radical Reconstruction falls out of favor, and people want to move west, right? Forgive and forget, um, uh, reunite, reconcile. Of course, white America wants this. Um, black Southerners want more help in being integrated into the national economy and culture. Um, we begin to see more of a shift away from, remember, what, what is abolition except the ultimate workers' rights movement, right? This is a movement to make human to make like people that are considered three-fifths of a human and don't receive any wages right fully human with some kind of a wage and rights citizenship etc like that is the most hardcore um uh, workers rights movement you can imagine it's not the only one 
There's the um, Knights of Labor and other radical unions in the north that are trying to unionize workers, raise wages, go on strike. So that is like a pretty dominant theme in the politics of the 1870s. Reconstruction ends and the whole abolition thing is done. We're entering now into a period of Jim Crow, but also anti-union efforts, right? Pullman, uh, strike, um, Great Railway Strike, uh, uh, all of the stuff um, that we learned about in previous chapters. Um, the fear, of course, being the most the most radical unions, like the Knights of Labor, are organizing industrial workers in the North, and they're trying to organize black and white agricultural workers in the South. And of course, the, the fear is that if you had an alliance between these two groups, it would be a very powerful alliance and it would be demographically like a lot of people. Um, so there is a kind of national push to like tamp down those movements. And also part of the idea of like moving West and shifting from the focus on reconstruction is about economics and like economics, not in like, more wages for workers, but more industry, more land grants, uh, less regulation to get the industry going, because that is the thinking, that's what's best for the economy. Um, we get more states' rights. Obviously, this is trouble if you're black in the South. Um, and we have a fairly conservative Supreme Court in the 1870s. Um, Plessy versus Ferguson establishes Jim Crow. Uh, Williams versus Mississippi basically allows for black codes and other things that don't violate the Constitution. Um, Lochner versus New York is about um, the hours of, uh, I think it's, I guess sometimes get Lochner and Henry Jacobs mixed up. One of them is about um, how many hours someone can work. Uh, and then the other, let's check the book here. You think I'm messing around with like not not doing, not practicing this stuff, but I'm not messing around. I forget stuff here. Um, and I can't find it now. But I know roughly where it is, or do I? Yeah, okay, Lochner is the Baker's one. Yeah, Lochner is the Baker's one. Um, and then uh, Inri Jacobs is about uh, public uh, health, right? That like cigar, that yes, and yes, you can. Uh, roll cigars in disgusting tenements because the government doesn't have the the power to enforce the laws on, on this kind of on a company that wants to roll cigars in a disgusting tenement. So nice. Um, and then Lochner is about um, uh, the uh, work, how long a baker can work, right? That by by saying there's a 10 hour workday maximum, it's the state is um, um, uh, that's a power the state doesn't have. Right. Um, a lot of people want 10 hour work days. They want to work less. Um, but this is saying it's a violation of their rights. Uh, the same way that ch child labor laws were struck down. Right. The children have the right to get them out there. Let them work. Let them go out. And yeah, they get crushed by machines and stuff, but they're bringing home that, you know, they're bringing home the money. Um, scientific racism. This is really important. I brought this up earlier. Um, right. Before the Civil War. You have white supremacy because it's the law, right? Black people are not citizens. Um, uh, the Dred Scott decision puts them in a very marginalized place, even free blacks in the North. Um, eight, uh, 13th, 14th, 15th Amendment settles that, that's over. But that's exactly the time where you have the rise of scientific racism. So just as the legal justification for slavery or racial supremacy, white supremacy is going down, the scientific quote unquote justification for white supremacy and racial hierarchy going up, right? So right at the kind of cross right there, the mid 19th century, bad stuff. Okay, um, here's old Blaine in the background. He is the leader of the Republican party for, for in the 1870s and 80s. Um, 1880s, remember the radical Republicans? Well, they're not popular anymore, right? All that stuff about racial equality, come on, give it a rest. Um, the Republican Party becomes more liberal. And when I say liberal, this isn't like we use it now, right? 
like a liberal Democrat or whatever. Liberal in this time period, really up until the 1930s. So from when John Locke is writing about economics and Adam Smith is writing about economics to the 1930s, liberal means what we would call libertarian, right? In the modern kind of era, we say libertarian, like free markets, laissez-faire, small government, no regulation. Um, in the 1880s, that's the liberal wing of the Republican Party, as opposed to the radical wing, which is abolitionist, pro-worker. So the Republican Party has these kind of dual factions here, right? One which is kind of radical, what we would really consider radical left, and the other which is kind of more hardcore right, right, from our modern perspectives, right? Um, Blaine is on the right. He's the one who wants to shift to more laissez-faire liberal policies. Um, and then the extreme radical Republicans get marginalized in the party, right? So some leave the Republican Party and join the populist movement. Others become socialists, right? Again, the Republican Party has this tension from the beginning of wanting to support workers, right? enslaved workers, wanting to liberate them, right, from slavery, but also wanting to support industry, right? So there's a, in, what we get is eventually that can't hold. You either have to support the boss of the industry or the workers of the industry, and that's where we get this break. Some become socialists, uh, some become progressives, or populists rather, and um, the ideas emerge again on the other side of the political spectrum in the New Deal, um, a lot of the workers' rights things that um, the radical Republicans were advocating for, we see again in the Roosevelt administration. Okay, very quickly, some of the like the big dogs of the era and how their politics changed. This is not great man history. I don't care about that. It's not really that important. But let's go over some of the stuff. Teddy, got to talk about Teddy Roosevelt, but not, not that much. Um, you know, he's a reformer. He takes on the monopolies. He likes national parks. He likes to go hunting. What, what else do you need to know? That's about it, right? Um, 43rd president after McKinley is killed. He's then, I think, the youngest person to assume the presidency. Um, he is a Republican. He eventually shifts to the Bull Moose Party because he's not happy with the direction of the more liberal or what we would call libertarian Blaineite wing of the party. Robert La Follette, he's a Republican. He's from Wisconsin. He becomes a progressive, eventually becomes a socialist, right? That's La Follette is up here. Right with the, with the cheekbones, um, William Jennings Bryan. I mean, poor this fellow has been around in every way, shape, and form for a long time. His bag of tricks seems like it's kind of bottomless. He begins when we first see William Jennings Bryan. He's an agrarian Democrat, a, a populist Democrat. The uh, the you know cross of gold speech and all that kind of stuff, um, and then he eventually becomes a progressive Dem. Uh, and later in his life, he's actually the um, attorney uh, representing the state in the uh, Scopes monkey trial. So kind of jumps the shark there uh, with the whole evolution thing. Um, and that's the last time we see um, WJB. Woodrow Wilson gets elected in the 19 teens. He's a Southern Democrat. That's a really big deal. Remember, Southern Democrats are the ones that like did that stuff in the 18 early 1860s, the Civil War stuff, kind of not cool. Um, the fact that Woodrow Wilson, a Southerner and a Democrat, can be elected to national politics 50 years after the Civil War shows you how um, the American electorate, the white American electorate, is willing to move on, right? I mean, they st like they started the Civil War. Like, it's kind of a big deal, right? Eugene Debs, we've seen him before as a union leader. Um, he runs as a presidential candidate from jail uh, and gets, uh, you know, a couple million votes or something. So there, there's Debs over here. Uh, there's uh, WJB. There's Woodrow Wilson, Woody Woo, and La Follette. So do we need to know about this great man history stuff? Not really, but it's important to know that this is a time of political change. And that, you know, Roosevelt goes kind of shifts to more um, kind of libertarian left poli politics. Um, uh, 
Debs becomes increasingly polit like in the political mainstream, running for president, um, that kind of stuff. All right, let's go over some of these movements. Some of this is review. Raise less corn and more hell. That's a, uh, Mary Elizabeth Lease. She is a um, prolific speaker uh, uh, and uh, populist. Um, and she said that about people in Kansas. Kansas in this time, you think of Kansas in the 21st century as being deeply conservative. Um, it was religiously conservative back then too, but it was a place where there was a lot of radical political movements. The populists were were centered in rural America. And this idea of raising less corn and more hell is a kind of populist slogan, right? That, that it's not just the job of farmers to just farm, but rather, right, let's get political. Um, they fight back, right? Remember, why are farmers radical in a kind of what we would call a kind of leftist way? Well, because that makes perfect sense. Um, uh, agrarian communities, farming communities are inherently communal. People help each other, people chip in and raise a barn, um, uh, uh, harvest crops, people, very tight knit community and communal living, right? That lends itself to people working together to better the livelihood and the lives of everyone around. So you don't need to read Marx. You don't need some kind of radical po political tract to, you know, inform your political, your, your, your worldview or your politics. They know the system is rigged against them. They know that um, in previous generations, remember the dream of the yeoman farmer, right, is to be fully independent and self-sustaining. They know they're getting squeezed and they can't do that when they're paying all of these high duties, right, taxed, uh, taxes on transporting their grain. You have uh, the government giving away basically free land to big corporations when they can't afford new land. They know the system is rigged and it's rigged against them. So they have a kind of radical populist agenda. We saw this with the Grange movement in the previous chapter, uh, 1870s. They want to regulate uh, elevator rates, that is to say how much um, it, what, what one has to pay to put their grain on a uh, uh, train car to ship it across state lines. Uh, they establish workers' cooperatives, so collective ownership of the stuff that they produce, which helps, again, everyone um, uh, 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 succeed economically. The result of this in the 1890s is the Okala platform. I don't think this is actually in your book. They talk about the Omaha platform. I'll, this is in the next slide. Omaha. This is Okala, not Omaha, Nebraska, but Okala, Florida, um, is a kind of uh, predecessor to the Omaha platform. Okala platform, Farmers Alliance. What do they want? They want direct election of senators. Remember, senators are not elected directly yet. Constitution doesn't have that. Constitution is that senators are appointed by state legislature. That's they want they want to get rid of that. Right. So they want to vote not only for the House of Representatives folks, which has always been the case that's voted for by right uh, um, based on each district votes for their person. They want direct election of senators. They want um, more regulated banking. Right. There's booms and busts. They don't like these cycles of boom and bust because often it's them that do not bounce back from the bust. This is the same thing we have now, right? GameStop kind of stuff. Like, you know, when, uh, you know, a hedge fund makes a big mistake, they get bailed out by the government, i.e. the uh, taxpayers, right? Um, uh, bail them out and they keep going. Um, but when um, individuals or small businesses lose everything, that's the free market, yo. Uh, tough luck. Uh, so this is what they want. They want to have a safety net for them, for their effectively small businesses, right? Agrarian businesses. And they want silver standards so that money flows a little more freely. Um, and then lastly, they want a graduated or progressive income tax, right? With marginal tax brackets. That is to say, you know, you make this much money, it's 10% tax. This much money, it's 12% tax. This much money, it's all the way up, up, up. That's why it's a progressive because it progresses. The tax rates go up, up, up. The marginal tax rates go up, up, up. Um, it's important. I don't have a slide on this, but it makes me just remember that most people don't know how a progressive income tax works or how marginal tax rates work. You see this all the time with politicians. 
um, uh, who don't want higher taxes. You know, if someone proposes, say, a 70% marginal tax rate on income over $3 million a year, right? You'll have some politicians saying, mm, do you think that minimum wage workers want to pay 70% taxes if you make $7 an hour? Do you want 70% of your... That's not how it works. It's just stupid. Like, it's a lie. You're lying, right? You're either lying um, or you don't know what you're talking about, right? Because marginal tax rates don't work that way. So what they are pro uh, uh, proposing here and what we have now in the United States or in England with a progressive tax is, right, you... Your econ teachers are probably better explaining this than I am, but like, let's say, you know, the, you, it's a 10% tax on the first, on uh, people making up to $10,000, right? 10% of that goes to taxes, you keep the rest. The next marginal tax rate is 12%. So from $10,001 wage or, or earnings a year to say 20,000, you're going to pay 12% of that. So that means that if you make $20,000, the first 10 is taxed at 10%. The next 10 is taxed at 12%. You don't pay 12% on the whole 20. You pay 12% on right 10 to 20, and you pay 10% on 0 to 10. And that goes all the way up to like 5 million, right? So if you make 5 million in $1 a year, and the top marginal tax rate on income above five million dollars say right it's 90 percent you're going to, you're going to be taxed 90 cents on that one dollar right the one dollar that makes it into that top marginal tax rate which is at 90 percent that doesn't mean that all of your weight all of your earnings are taxed at 90 percent right your first ten thousand dollars just like the person working at Mickey D's, the first 10,000 is taxed at 10%, the next 12 or the next 10 at 12%, up, 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 and that $1 over 5 million, yeah, you're going to pay 90 cents on that dollar. Um, so that's how what they're, right, uh, uh, suggesting, because they don't, right, they make, they don't make a lot of money. So they want to, they'll pay some income tax, but they want JP Morgan to pay more. Right. J.P. Morgan can right first his first ten thousand dollars that he makes in, you know, 1895. The first ten grand that J.P. Morgan makes is taxed at 10 percent, just like everyone else. And it, 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 up, up, up. This is in, infuriating because obviously, as, as I've said many times, politics is not about the truth. Politics is about winning. So you just lie. Right. No one's going to want to, like, vote for a, a marginal tax rate, the top mar marginal tax rate of 90 percent if they think that their thirty thousand dollar a year job is going to be taxed at 90 percent but that's just not how it works and politicians lie about this all the time anyway that's what they want um populism now this is the omaha platform so we got the okala platform kind of precursor to it then the omaha platform is the big one and this is in your book um it's a big kind of amalgamation of Farmers Alliance, who is the Okala platform folks. There's free money, uh, monet like money machine go burr political movements, um, urban knights of labor, which are like radical unions. Um, what do they want? Same thing as Okala, direct election of centers. They want referendums, which we have in California, the prop system or referendums, gives people more power to the people, as messy as that is. Silver coinage, again, with the progressive income tax, don't forget how it works, um, don't get fooled. State ownership of certain industries, yee, 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 that sounds pretty radical, right? Um, yeah, 1892 is not 1917. You have to remember that state ownership of certain industries looks a lot different in terms of a political position in 1892 than it does in 1952, right? Once the Soviet Union becomes the kind of big bad, um, then the idea of state ownership of anything is associated with communism and communism is the Soviet Union. In 1892, it just makes sense to a lot of populist um, reformers that something like railroads shouldn't be owned by individuals because they can like crank the price prices to the roof and that's not fair right they can they they gives them way too much power so if the government owns it and regulates it that like f like we have freeways right i guess in orange county everything is privatized but like um in the rest of the in the real world 
right? Um, roads are funded by the public and they're maintained by taxes, so they're government, right, kind of owned. Um, so that's what they want with um, railroads. Eight hour workday, sounds nice. And then the Omaha platform is, as I said earlier, this kind of like organizing between urban, rural, black and white, northern and southern um, is the, the um, what kind of defines the Omaha platform. Okay, what's happening here, right? This is a time of political change, as I've said. It's a time of populism, of, you know, the demos, the people rising up, acting up, making demands, wanting direct election of senators, wanting to tax, right? The elite wanting to regulate um, banking, all of this stuff. Um, they're attacking centralized power. They're attacking power that is located in an elsewhere. It's not Omaha. It's not Okala. It's not Kansas, it's way off, right? Wall Street is what we would kind of write nowadays, right? It's big banks, it's big corporations, um, big industry. Uh, this is, again, the people versus the elite, the demos versus the aristoi, the democratic, right? The demos being people in Greek, aristoi being like the elite, right? We've seen this. Jefferson versus Madison is the same breakdown. Jefferson, like, Obviously, there's contradictions inherent in what he's arguing for because he's an enslaver. But his idea is centralized power in New York City, big banks, bad, more power to the yeoman farmers. Same thing with Jackson, right? The Whig agenda, wanting more power in Washington, bad, more power to the right, the, you know, the everyday Democratic Republican voter, the yeoman. In the 1800s, for Jefferson, for Jackson, again, this is a very limited understanding of the demos, right? The people, it's very white, it's very um, a male, and for Jefferson, it's elite, right? Uh, the twist is for Jackson, it becomes not elite, right? So poor whites are included. Um, but nonetheless, the enemy is the federal government. Right. The federal government's the problem for the elite view of Jefferson. The federal government is the problem for the more democratic but still white supremacist view of Jackson. And they appeal to the Constitution, which is going to keep the government small. Right. I mean, heck, Jefferson would have appealed to the um, uh, uh, Articles of Confederation. Right. So you see the, the Constitution expands the size of government in Jefferson's perspective. But nonetheless, it limits what Washington can do. So that is the document that, right, if you're kind of strict interpretation of the Constitution, you say you can't do that, Madison. You can't do that, Clay. It's not in the Constitution. You can't do it. 1800. By 1900, something has changed. There's no Andrew Carnegie right, in Jefferson's time. Uh, there's no Vanderbilt or Rockefeller in Jackson's time. Um, the enemy is powerful politicians, not big industrialists. By 1900, things have changed somewhat, right? By 1900, it's increasingly the demos, the people, is more diverse. It's free, it's free black African Americans in the North. It even potentially is, right, uh, uh, black people in the South, uh, if they're, right, bold enough to be actually advocating for their rights, and many are. Um, it's increasingly means women. After the Wong Kim Ark decision and people born in the United States are citizens, it means immigrants or the children of immigrants. So it's an increasingly diverse group of people, and they are also against centralized power, but the centralized power in 1900 is not Washington. Washington's anemic, right? That's the whole idea of liberal laissez-faire, small government, small government, small government, all power to the corporations. People say, forget that. The enemy is the corporation for the progressives and the populace. So it's the same perspective in a lot of ways as the Jeffersonians and Jacksonians, but the aim is slightly different. The target is different. The big bad, right, the enemy for Jefferson and Jackson is Washington. The big bad, the enemy for the populace and progressives is, you know, Wall Street, if you want to use, you know, a kind of um, 
uh, is it synecdoche? Is that the literary term? Um, or one thing stands in for another. I think it's called synecdoche. Ask your English teachers. Um, uh, like if you say, I got a new, I got a new set of wheels, right? That's synecdoche, right? Because you didn't just get like some like seven wheels, right? You got a car. Um, and similarly, I think when people say like Washington today, this happened in Washington, that's synecdoche um, for the United States. But again, I'm not an English teacher. I don't know. Um, so anyway, that's the enemy, Wall Street. Right, New York, New York City, big banks, whatever, um, more corporate power. So this is not new. It's not new. What's new is the power of private industry. What's not new is the idea that there's people who want more power at the local level and that there's something out there that's preventing that. For Jefferson, it's largely theoretical, right? Because he doesn't like Washington hasn't had the opportunity to like usurp or to take on too much power, but he's wary of it. Um, by Jackson's time, you know, the, the tension is real. Um, and then by this time period, it's not Washington anymore. It's right corporate corporations. Um, super important and very easy for you to remember what's happening when you see that genealogy move uh, from one right from the beginning of the century to the end. Uh, very, very uh, quickly here, this stuff, I'm not gonna go over all of it. This is the kind of like what it did. Uh, Pendleton Act is civil service exam that gets rid of corruption or eliminate, it, it lessens corruption. You can't just like give your buddies jobs anymore. You take an exam, you do well, you get the job. Sherman Antitrust Act, supposed to break up monopolies. Um, actually it's used against unions. So there's a big oof there. Um, Australian ballot or secret ballot helps prevent corruption at the polls. Direct primaries. That is what we have now. People vote in primaries. It's not like the parties that pick the candidates. Uh, initiative referendum and recall. Again, more direct democracy. Pure Food and Drug Act, right? Upton Sinclair, the jungle. It's really about workers' rights, but like the food is hella gross. So like, Right, that's that stuff gets passed. Um, now, right, worker protections, Hepburn Act, no collusion. There's no collusion. The Hepburn Act is about um, monopolies, right, and breaking up monopolies. There is no collusion, right? When in terms of this is like one of the most frustrating things of like the 2018 or 2019 or what have you, is right this idea that with the impeachment if you're watching this in like 20 you know 20 to 2200 or whatever um just to give you the reference impeachment of the president donald trump there's this idea the russian right that they're working together whatever there is no collusion because collusion is not even a term that's at all legally applicable to that to like you know collaborating or working with a foreign power. Collusion is something that happens when a monopoly forms and it's only, the only legal meaning it has is in like trust and antitrust law, right? So it's not about like passing notes in class. It's not about a Vladimir Putin helping you get elected. It's not about like, cheating on the AP exam with your friends with like a hand code system that none of that is collusion in the legal um, uh, sense collusion only has to do with monopolies and trusts and that's what they do they collude to manipulate the market various entities collude work together to manipulate prices and manipulate the free market that's what the Hepburn Act takes on collusion and the only real legal meaning of that term, right? So to say like, you know, as you heard a bazillion times, and this isn't just from like the Trump defense attorneys, this is like the news media, right? It's so it, like, it's been dumbed down to such a point where like, even like the news is talking about, it's like not legally applicable at all, it's maddening. Anyway, 1906, let's get back to, right, the turn of the century. Hepburn Act, no collusion, can't collude, can't have trust and monopolies. Uh, Newlands Reclamation Act, this basically creates federal jobs for public works. This is uh, ironically one of the demands of Coxey's army um, 10 years prior um, or 20 years prior. 
uh, that they wanted these unemployed workers wanted federal jobs like doing like building roads or like clearing forests or something and then you pay us seems like to make sense right um they don't get it they all go to jail um but by 1903 the new lands uh reclamation act creates public jobs to help clear out forest you know make logging trails ostensibly to make it easier to go logging right um, and then in the new deal we'll see that again right it's going to be a major cornerstone of the new deal legislation is creating federally um, uh, funded public works like, like all kinds of different programs which is something people even now with the kind of coronavirus pandemic and everyone being out of work that idea has been floated like why not just have the the government build like help build roads everywhere or build housing you know to address the homeless crisis and then people who are out of work you know, masons or carpenters or whomever, you can learn the trade, employ them, have them build the stuff, right? Uh, it happened in the 30s. Uh, okay, amendments to the Constitution. 16, income tax, um, and a personal income tax. So the argument about a graduated or progressive income tax, it happens, right, in 1913. It's not as progressive as it is in, say, the 1930s. By the 1930s, early 1940s, the highest marginal tax rate is, I think, 90% plus um, on, like, incomes over whatever it is, however, 10 million or something, right, in, like, 1930s money. Uh, but this is an income, it's a big deal, because, like, finally, the federal government can make some revenue, right? There's no, this is revenue. How does the federal government make money before the 16th Amendment? It's got to be tariffs and land sales and other kind of schemes. So finally, with the um, uh, a personal income tax, um, you can have more money coming into the government. 17th Amendment is direct election of senators. That is, right, Okla platform, Omaha platform, populist demand. They get it. 18th is um, prohibition. So, like, you know, it's not all fun and games, right? Um, uh, or it's maybe none of it is fun and games, certainly, if you're looking at from the perspective of some, like, you know, uh, an Irish immigrant that actually likes to drink or something. That gets repealed. I think it's the 21st Amendment. Um, it's easy to remember that, although I always forget because eight, like the two legal drinking ages that the United States has seen are 21 and 18. Um, so there's that. But that, again, even this, it seems like, well, this is weird. What's happening here, right? Um, this is happening because this is part of that scientific approach to things that we've seen in the progressive and populist era. It, people will be better workers, better largely gendered, better husbands, um, better mothers, right, if they're not drunk all the time. And this is something that a lot of Americans have been pushing for since the early republic, temperance, right, that it makes you better, and both for, you know, religious reasons and now scientific reasons. 19th Amendment, women um, uh, get the right to vote at the federal level. Remember, um, uh, Western states are the first ones to to do this. Some states, right, early on, New Jersey, uh, women can vote for a short time, but it's repealed. Um, so now, that's a big deal. Women can vote. Um, 19th Amendment. Okay, beyond politics, I said, what, 40, what I guess, 43 minutes? Is that going to happen? Let's see, not if I keep on talking about it. Um, progressivism. Logic. Facts and logic, guys. Real facts and logic. Not like facts and logic like it's often used now, right? The the sophistry of, uh, you know, uh, radio and internet demigods, uh, demagogues, uh, but rather like, let's do a scientific study and find out what the best way to do, you know, put watches together is. Um, science, morality, pragmatism, book doesn't talk about it. it's American philosophy, it's um, uh, um, a uh, approach to philosophy that uses pragmatism and kind of scientific logical approach so like don't just hang on to old ideas if they're not useful anymore don't just read aristotle and say like you know what he says about science or astronomy and go like well this is aristotle's the best so let's just think you know whatever he says is right right worms are just like 
spontaneously formed out of clots of dirt. Like, no, that's actually not how it works. Um, you've got to change your philosophy when the world changes. Um, scientific management, this is Taylorism. Book does talk about this at some point. This is not Fordism. This is not an assembly line. This is what you see in the background image here. It is a scientific approach to like how you work. What should you do, for, like an Ikea, I don't know if you've ever put Ikea furniture together, but like you do this thing first and then you do this thing second, then you do this thing third, you do this thing fourth, as opposed to people who are like, well, I'm gonna do this fourth one first and this second one third or whatever. No, strict movement and then timing to make sure your timing is right. That's Taylorism. Uh, domestic science is scientific management applied to the domestic sphere. Uh, this is a time period where you see a um, profusion of cookbooks published, women authors saying, let's take the scientific rational approach that people are using in industries uh, and in the public sphere, right? And let's apply it to the private sphere. What is the best way to cook something? How do we measure, right? Old school cookbooks, you can see I, part of my dissertation was on this. Old school cookbooks, it's like take, you know, take a pat of butter the size of an egg. Well, what, a quail egg, a duck egg? What kind of egg, right? Where this with domestic science, you get one, you know, three tablespoons of this, you know, this many ounces of that, a cup of this. So it's very scientific, very rational. Um, the Wisconsin idea, uh, lastly, which is from the University of Wisconsin, we associate it with my man in the background, Robert La Follette. Um, he is a leader of progressive reforms in Wisconsin and nationwide. Remember La Follette's journey from Republican to progressive to socialists. Um, and the Wisconsin idea is that you can reduce government corruption through um, the recall and referendum process, um, but also that you the government should partner with universities to figure out what's the best way to govern. Like, it's incredible. Right? What a like incredible idea, right? You want to talk about whether we should or shouldn't have a graduated or progressive income tax? Let's have economists and uh, other experts who work in the university do studies and then tell us what they think. Um, what about a highway system? Well, let's get geologists and engineers and make them put a study together and then tell us what is the best policy. And then we pass legislation based on the facts, the empirical data that we get from universities. Pretty good idea. Um, child labor laws, like, is it good when kids work? Let's do a study. Oh, they get like killed all the time uh, or like maimed or, and you know, it's, it's destroying family life. Hmm. Maybe we should do something about that. Building codes. Oh, people get, oh, the triangle shirtwaist fire. It's not a good idea to like chain the doors shut. Oh, let's maybe pass laws that say you can't do that. Uh, so this is the idea. I know very political, getting really political, right? The idea here is it's not political. It's just like, it's like common sense once you do the research. That's the Wisconsin idea. And that is um, something that is the, the progressive movement uses to say, this is not, you know, this is not difficult to figure out what kind of legislation you should pass. Uh, just do a study and then like do what the study says, right? It's pretty simple. Um, okay, 46 minutes, that's not bad estimation. Um, three minutes off. Um, uh, and that's all. Uh, there's, I'm not going to get into more of the arcania of the Gilded Age politics because I think it's boring. Uh, so if you have questions about it, you can ask me in class. Um, otherwise, see you when I see you.